Frank Sinatra versus Nevada gaming officials, the Sam Giancana connection. Frank Sinatra first performed in Las Vegas at the Desert Inn in 1951, but then he started performing at the Sands when it opened in 1952 and was given a 2% ownership stake in the Sands by 1955. Welcome to the Sands Hotel as Vice President in Charge of Entertainment. I hereby officially welcome you to this saloon. By 1961, Sinatra owned 9% of the Sands, which represents an investment in excess of $200,000. Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana was the leader of the Chicago outfit from 1957 to 1966. Al Capone was an earlier leader of the outfit which was the most powerful organized crime gang, not just in Chicago, but the Midwest, and they expanded their enterprise all the way to Nevada, California, and Florida. Giancana was also known as Sam Mooney and Momo. He was funny, he was comical, he was witty, he was smart. Sam was narcissistic, grandiose. I mean, the man could have it all and yet live with nothing. He really wasn't a bad guy. Deep down inside, he had a good heart. And Sam had a, a little bit too much wine, and Sam announced, I can call Frank Sinatra up right now, and that son of a bitch will call me right back. And they said, oh, sure, Sam, you know, you're full of crap. Butch, go dial the number. And sure enough, he had Frank Sinatra on the phone, and he's passing the phone around to everybody. In 1960, Momo was one of 11 men to be put on the first list of the Black Book, which bans you from all Nevada casinos for life. A casino can lose its gaming license if any Black Book member is found in a casino. Also, if someone with a gaming license associates with a member of the Black Book, either professionally or socially, they can lose their license. The FBI said in 1962 that Giancana is generally considered as the number one gangland leader in the country today, is ruthless without human feeling. Giancana, if given blanket authority by the national board, would be responsible for an untold number of gangland killings in Chicago. As it stands now, he must be at least a bit discriminating as to whom he picks as the next victim. The FBI also said in recent years, considerable information has been reported concerning Sinatra ties with Giancana and that he is very close to Frank and that anything that Sinatra does, Giancana is a part of it. Sinatra was interviewed by the FBI on April 25, 1961, and he said that he met Giancana a few years ago socially, but has no business dealings with him and knows nothing about Giancana's affairs. On July 6, 1960, Sinatra applied for a 25% interest in the Calneva Lodge at Lake Tahoe at a cost of $100,000, and the application was approved by the Nevada gaming officials. The next year, Sinatra owned 37% of the Cal Neva, where he was performing on a regular basis, and by 1962, he owned 50% of the Northern Nevada Casino. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sands Hotel, this uh, wonderful opening night. I gather the Dean has mentioned the fact that uh, we came down late last night or early this morning at 3 o'clock and uh, having just closed at Cal Neva. We had some interesting experiences up there that you might be interested in. For instance, I am one of the proprietors of Cal Neva Lodge, and uh, I've been one for two years now. However, I didn't read the contract till this year. <laughs> it turns out that my partners had the Nevada side with the gaming jobs and the slot machines and the whiskey and the girls, and I had the other side, the California side. <laughs> I had a couple of paid toilets and a little smog on my side. <laughs> and a nude picture of Richard Nixon on the wall that I'd be left behind. I was never thrilled with him when he was fully dressed, let alone having a nude picture. <laughs> He's got cute knees, though, I noticed in the picture. 
All in all, it was a nice summer up there. We had Milton Berle and a whole set of new gowns. And we had the African Queen for a weekend. Johnny Mathis, he came up and spent the weekend with us. He writes me letters once in a while on lavender paper and it smells so good too when I open the envelope. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad to be back out of the altitude. I had nosebleeds four times a day up there. Some guy kept hitting me all the time. <laughs> That's a silly joke. In January 1962, an FBI informant advised that Sam Giancana informed him at the time that he owned a half interest in the Calneva Lodge with Frank Sinatra. There are roughly 100 yards of secret tunnels beneath the Calneva. They run under the main lodge and even branch out to the cabanas, all to ensure that anything or anyone could be moved in and out of the resort without being seen. Originally, these were bootlegging tunnels during Prohibition, but when the Mafia moved in, these tunnels hid their illegal operations and even some of their celebrity friends. San Francisco Chronicle columnist Herb Cain said in 1962, I saw Sinatra at the Cal Neva when Sam Giancana was there. In fact, I met Giancana through Frank. He was a typical hood, didn't say much. He wore a hat at the lake and sat in his little bungalow receiving people. Sinatra would fly Giancana to the Cal Neva in his personal plane, and sometimes money would leave the Cal Neva in Sinatra's plane. We always had him on the manifest as Dr. Sam Mooney. According to his pilot, Sinatra's plane would fly bags of cash out of the Calneva. And they would be counting money in stacks, not bills. They were just counting stacks. Dean Martin was an owner of the Calneva with Sinatra, but then he sold his shares when he found out the Chicago mob boss was a silent owner. On July 16, 1963, Giancana convinced a federal judge in Chicago to order the FBI to stop its all-out shadowing and harassment of him. The judge said the FBI can keep a close eye on the Chicago mobster, but must back off some because the FBI had turned to illegal tactics as a result of ineptest futility or evident failure in a previous investigation. The day after U.S. District Judge Richard B. Austin ordered the FBI to limit its surveillance of hoodlum San Giancana, the mobster hopped a plane for a Nevada rendezvous with singer Frank Sinatra. Momo would spend about the next 10 days at the Cal Neva Lodge watching his girlfriend, Phyllis McGuire, perform with the McGuire sisters at the Lake Tahoe Resort. Late one night, the Mafia leader got into a fist fight outside Miss McGuire's cabin. The resultant publicity brought state agents to Calneva to investigate why a member of the Black Book was on the property of the Calneva and who knew about it. A Nevada state spokesman said, No one of the reputation of Giancana could have visited the Sinatra Hotel Casino for nearly a fortnight without the top management being aware of his presence. Frank Sinatra called Nevada Gaming Control Board Chairman Ed Olson on August 31st to tell him to stop the investigation about the Cal Neva and the mob boss. The phone conversation included an implied threat and a barrage of obscenities and insults. Sinatra even called Olson, who used a cane because of childhood polio, a crippled SOB. Guy Farmer had been the gaming board's public information officer for a few weeks when Ed Olson told Farmer to pick up the phone so he could listen to the phone conversation as it was happening because the gaming control board chairman had no way to record the phone call. Pretty much making it clear that, that he was bigger than the state of Nevada and didn't have to follow our, our rules. At the board's office, listening in to the call, Farmer couldn't believe what he heard. Sinatra said if Olson continued to pursue the investigation that uh, uh, Sinatra threatened a big fat surprise. A big fat surprise? A big fat surprise. He didn't think Sinatra meant the surprise would be in court. No, I don't think so. 
some other kind of surprise. What other kind of surprise do you have in mind? I'm asking you. No, I just think of the fat surprise as a threat of some kind of physical violence, something like that. That's the only kind of fat surprise I'm thinking of. Earlier this year, Guy Farmer talked about the phone call. And I'm in the office on a Saturday morning. And Frank hears that we're going to file an action to revoke his gambling license. He's not happy about that. He's used to playing by his own rules. I you know, I don't have to. And Sinatra calls him up and says, why don't you come on up to the Calneva and have a nice dinner, you know, and we can talk about this. And Olson said, why don't you come to my office here in Carson City and I'll tell you the evidence we have. You hosted the Godfather. We told you not to do that. And, uh, well, Sinatra is furious. Sinatra is used to playing by his own rules. In the phone conversation, when Olson says, we're going forward with this license revocation, Sinatra just goes berserk. I'm the young guy, Ed tells me to pick up, we don't have bugging, wiretapping stuff in the office or anything, and I'm, I'm the bug on the line. And Sinatra chews him out. Well, Ed had polio when he was young, and he walked with walking sticks. Our friend did last night. And it's hard for Ed to get around, and he's in pain. And Sinatra calls him a, a crippled SOB. He's not a nice guy. Even though he could be a nice guy, he wasn't. So he reamed out Ed Olson and said, you're done. If you continue to prosecute this case, I'll have a big fat surprise for you. Nevada Governor Grant Sawyer, having seen a memo of Sinatra's obscenity-laced phone call, told Olson not to back off and to not be intimidated by him. President John F. Kennedy, while visiting Nevada, asked the Nevada governor, What are you guys doing to my friend, Frank Sinatra? Well, Mr. President, Sawyer said, I'll try to take care of things here in Nevada, and I wish you luck on the national level. On Labor Day weekend, just after the Sinatra Olson phone call, two Nevada gaming board agents were at the Cal Neva on a routine visit when Sinatra saw the two agents and told co-owner and hotel manager Paul Skinny D'Amato to get them off the property. Coincidentally, there's a scheduled visit by two gaming control officers to check the, the, the auditors. The auditors. Yeah. They walk in. It's Labor Day weekend. Frank yells across the casino, get those dirty SOBs out of here to uh, Skitty D'Amato. So Skitty decides, I'm going to handle this with a plum. He slips a $100 bill into the crook of one of the gaming control board <laughs> elbows. And the guy goes, is that a bribe? And he goes, he said, no, I just appreciate you civil servants working on Labor Day weekend. <laughs> On September 11, 1963, Edward Olson signed a complaint against Frank Sinatra, charging that the singer associated and spoke to Giancana without asking him to leave Calneva. In the complaint, Olson said, Sinatra has for a number of years maintained and continued social association with said Giancana, well knowing his unsavory and notorious reputation, and has openly stated that he intends to continue such association. Sinatra was also accused of attempting to intimidate Olson with vile, intemperate, obscene, and indecent language. A Sinatra employee, Skinny D'Amato, was accused of trying to bribe a gaming board worker. The Nevada Gaming Control Board filed a complaint with the Nevada Gaming Commission to revoke the license of Frank Sinatra to hold an interest in the hotel. The revocation was based on the association of Sinatra with Giancana, the threat of Sinatra to Olson, chairman of the control board, vilification of other state officials, an attempt of Sinatra's agent to force money on two gaming control board agents, and the refusal of Sinatra's representative to respond to a subpoena of the gaming control board. The Honolulu Advertiser reported on October 4th that four subpoenaed state game officials met in secret session in Las Vegas with Frank Sinatra's attorney to give depositions detailing their license revocation case against the singer. 
Sinatra was told to respond to the charges by October 22nd or he would lose his gaming license. On October 7th, Frank's attorney, Harry Claiborne, announced that Sinatra would give up his gaming license and would sell his 50% share of the Cal Neva and 9% in the Sands in Las Vegas. The arrangement was that Sinatra would resell his nine points at the Sands at an agreed price of $43,500 per point. When originally purchasing these points, had paid an estimated $5,000 per point. Sinatra was in the middle of talks to merge his record label with Warner Records, and Frank said he was getting out of the casino business to concentrate on other businesses, including this merger. Even though Sinatra voluntarily gave up his license, the Gaming Commission still officially revoked his license. On October 22, 1963, the Nevada Gaming Commission ruled that the licenses of the Park Lake Enterprises Incorporated, which owns the Cal Neva, and Frank Sinatra were revoked and further ordered that any and all licenses outstanding in the name of Frank Sinatra at the Sands Hotel be revoked and that Sinatra be given until January 5, 1964 to dispose of his interest. He gave up. We revoked his license. <clears throat> and I'm glad we did. It was an important milestone in the gambling control history here in the state of Nevada. In three months, Sinatra experienced three sobering events. On October 22nd, his gaming license was revoked. On November 22nd, his friend, President John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. And in December, his 19-year-old son was kidnapped. The horrifying ordeal of Frank Sinatra Jr. began while he was filling an engagement at Lake Tahoe. He was on the bill at the Hora Casino. The elder Sinatra received eight phone calls with instructions on ransom payments. And in the early morning hours, more than two days later, was able to announce his son's return. He had a long rest at his mother's house after nearly three days with little sleep. Lloyd Shear in the Washington Post on January 12, 1964 wrote, On the same day five weeks ago that his son was kidnapped from a Lake Tahoe motel, Sinatra was denounced in Las Vegas by Edward Olson, who declared emphatically that holders of casino gaming licenses in Nevada who associate with gangsters and hoodlums, as singer Frank Sinatra did, will wind up on the wrong side of the tables. Giancana and Sinatra blamed each other for losing the ownership in the Cal Neva. Sam thought that Frank should not have yelled on the phone to Ed Olson about the investigation because Sam thought that there would be a short suspension of Sinatra's license and not a revocation if Frank didn't yell at Olson. Frank thought that Sam should not have come to the Cal Neva to watch his girlfriend perform. Sammy Davis Jr. was glad that the state of Nevada revoked Sinatra's license. Sammy spoke with Ed Olson at the Sands Hotel, telling the gaming official that he's needed this for years. I've been working with him for 16 years, and nobody's ever had the guts to stand up to him. Ed Olson is in a casino in Las Vegas, and Sammy Davis comes up to him and says, I'd like to talk to you. They go over in the corner, and Sammy said, I just want to thank you. Frank has needed that his whole life. <laughs> For somebody to tell him that he had to play by the rules, and everybody else has to play by it. Hooray for us. We won. He lost. A 19-page Justice Department memorandum prepared in 1962 suggests that Sinatra had contact with about 10 major hoodlums, some of whom had his unlisted number. In August 1963, the organized crime and racketeering section of the Justice Department started looking through IRS and FBI reports, and they focused on the connection between Giancana and Sinatra. U.S. Attorney Douglas McMillan was assigned to look at the case because he had already been investigating Sinatra for a while. But FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover wrote on an FBI memo, McMillan is a boy on a man's errand, and Hoover told his FBI agents not to investigate Sinatra 
without his approval. McMillan wanted to interview Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr., among other celebrities, but was shut down by the Justice Department. After two months, the only thing they found was a possibly false statement Sinatra had made to the IRS in 1959, when he had denied that Giancana had been present at a party Sinatra held in Atlantic City. An FBI informant, identified only as a professional chorus line dancer, said she had seen Giancana at the party. In October 1963, a Justice Department prosecutor determined that it was an apparent, though minor, violation of law, but not enough to prosecute. It would be the last time the FBI went after Frank Sinatra. Douglas McMillan believes that he was shut down by the Justice Department because of President John F. Kennedy's friendship with Sinatra. Did you feel you were being blocked? Uh, well, certainly I was not uh, being authorized to proceed as I thought we should. And where do you think the block was? Who was stopping you? Ultimately, it had to be the Attorney General. Bobby Kennedy? Yes. Bobby had been critical to his brother's election. If we had opened an investigation on Sinatra, it would, it would have been politically devastating to, uh, to JFK, I would, I would suppose. Nevada came up with a Sinatra law, which allowed entertainers to work in a casino without a gaming license. In the late 1960s, after playing at the Sands, Sinatra started playing at Caesars Palace. And welcome to Caesar's Palace. Hey, that ain't bad. Three kumbadas out of four. Oh, he's half Italian, though, Irv is. See, he's married to a Sicilian chick, Rosie. You know, every time the three or four of us get on a corner, we have a discussion, we get a subpoena. You get more than three Italians, you get a piece of paper. But what are you guys talking about? That's all they want to know, what are you talking about? I'll tell you what we're talking about, but it's got a mixed audience here. In 1970, Sinatra endorsed Republican Ronald Reagan for governor of California, and he became close friends with the Reagans, supporting his run for the presidency in 1980, and he hosted Reagan's presidential inaugural gala in January 1981. In 1979, Sinatra wanted to be an entertainment and public relations consultant for Caesars Palace at $20,000 per week, which would require a key employee gaming license. He also mentioned that he might want to buy a casino someday, and a lawyer for Sinatra did talk to the Dunes about having interest in the casino. So the Nevada gaming officials started a 13-month investigation into whether Sinatra should get a gaming license. There was a gaming control board hearing on February 11, 1981, where Frank Sinatra and others testified. The hearing was moved to City Hall because of all of the interest and it was broadcast live on local Las Vegas TV stations along with CNN. Did you at any time this prior to the purchase of the Cal Neva discuss that purchase and any financing of that purchase with Mr. Giancana? Never, no, never. Did you ever discuss with Mr. Giancana the fact that you might be a front for him at the Cal Neva or that he might be have some type of a hidden interest there? No, never. Okay. There came a time in 1963, in the, sometime between the 19th and the 27th of July of that year, when Mr. G. and Connor was at the Calneva Lodge. Did you have any prior knowledge, or did you issue an invitation to Mr. G. and Connor to come to the lodge? I never invited Mr. G. and Connor to come to Calneva Lodge. I never entertained him, and I never saw him. Sinatra also testified about his 1963 phone call with Gaming Control Board Chairman Ed Olson saying, I wonder if there's a human alive that hasn't lost his temper. We've taken a four-minute conversation and made it into an international incident. When asked whether he physically threatened Ed Olson, he said, That is not true. It would be pretty absurd to threaten a man who is crippled, wouldn't you say? We have uh, testimony uh, of Mr. Olson back in 1963 that you had indicated that possibly you had seen Mr. Giancana. Do you recall 
ever making that statement to Mr. Olson? Uh, no, I don't recall, but let me try to say, explain it this way, that if that, that was the period of 1963 where the, where the, uh, the unhappy moments between Mr. Olson and myself, I might have said almost anything. I was angry, I was frustrated, but I don't believe that I, if I said it, I don't believe I meant it, because I never saw him. Do you recall uh, going down to uh, Miss McGuire's bungalow and there walking into some type of an altercation with a gentleman, and uh, not an altercation that you were involved in, but seeing an altercation with a gentleman by the name of Collins? How did I stay out of that one? Is what I, <laughs> I don't know. No, I did not. Uh, I was not present. I was in Los Angeles when that happened. I got a phone call from one of my employees telling me that there had been a problem. And when did you then return? Were you, were you at Cal Neva the night that the McGuire sisters opened? I believe I might have been there, yes. Could have been there. You don't recall not directly? No, no. I tried to, uh, each time someone we engaged to perform opened, I tried to be there on opening nights because I thought as host, he should be there. Now, uh, during that period, I was in a film. And I came and I went back and forth as often as I could. So I could have been there opening night or could not have been there opening night. I tend to believe that I was there opening night. When Mrs. McGuire was interviewed on January the 27th of 1981, she indicated to our investigators that uh, it was her recollection that Mr. Giancana was there with her the first three to five days of her engagement and that to her best recollection, she thought you were there at the same time. Now, you have certainly testified otherwise. Mr. Rudin, I wonder, are you in a position to have any recollection on that particular incident? I must tell you, I've searched my recollection of something 17 years ago. And as a lawyer, I know my recollection could be faulty, but the best of my recollection was that I did not attend any McGuire sister's performance there, that Mr. Sinatra was not up there, and yet checking, checking in some of the records, I find that he went back and forth several times while the picture was on. Uh, I would have to tell you it is my recollection that he was not there, and I would also have to tell you that I don't have that much confidence in my recollection. Uh, on the event. Maybe I fixed in my mind that he wasn't there and that's now the story. I do know he didn't invite him and both of us were upset to find out that he was there. Uh, I don't recall whether he sent word up or I sent word up to tell the man to leave or whether I was on the premises. I'm a little confused about it but I do know neither one of us invited him and we're certainly unhappy about his presence. But did it happen that either you or Mr. Sinatra did notify the management at Cal Neva that they were to invite Mr. Giancana to leave? I think, if I may, Please. I think it was uh, Mickey who called and spoke to the man of the people who were employed by us to ask him to leave the premises. And I think I remember uh, the, the counselor telling me that. Do you recall being advised that subsequent to that he did leave? Yes, yes. And I don't recall advising him. I took it upon myself to issue those instructions, and I don't even recall discussing the matter with Mr. Sinatra do you have until any, subsequently. Do you have any knowledge that the Cal Neva either provided complimentary room, food, beverages, transportation, or anything to Mr. Giancana while he was there? No. I have no, no knowledge of that at all. Ronald Reagan sent a character letter to the gaming board before the presidential election in the fall of 1980, supporting Sinatra's effort to get a gaming license. Actors Kirk Douglas, Gregory Peck, the sheriff of Los Angeles County, and a Catholic priest, among others, also testified in support of Sinatra. The L.A. County Sheriff said, I feel I have spent a lifetime in inquiring and investigating Sinatra, and at the same time enjoying a very close personal relationship with him. If Mr. Sinatra is a member of the Mafia, then I'm the godfather. No one testified against Frank Sinatra. 
during the time that you were a licensee uh, at Cal Neva and probably prior to that, you were also a licensee at the Sands Hotel. That's true. Could you indicate uh, to the board uh, how that investment came about? In the Sands? Yes. Uh -huh. So uh, the investment came about because I was working in New York very, uh, very briefly. I was working in the in the uh, Copacabana, New York, and one Jack and Trotter, who was the uh, manager of the club, uh, said to me, there are some people getting together to build a, a new hotel in Las Vegas. And uh, I said, fine, what about it? He said, well, would you like to be part of it? and uh, also be a working member of the, of the organization. For, uh, uh, for example, uh, tell us uh, how large the theater should be, whom, whom we should uh, um, invite to play uh, on the stage, and so on and so forth. And I said, I'd be delighted to. And uh, as time went on, uh, I came to, to uh, Nevada. Um, and played at the Desert Inn, which was my first visit as an entertainer. I'd been here earlier just visiting. And uh, at that point, they had the, I think the first meeting took place somewhere in that period. And they drew up plans and the, ho and the hotel uh, was to be as it looks now, whatever, it's, uh, whatever the plan was. And uh, I bought, I think two or three, Share, so to speak, in the thing, and I, and I got that money by by borrowing it from nightclub owners, where I had made contracts to play, and they advanced me the monies. In several cases, not many of them, maybe three or four. And after that, I acquired some more stock, and that I cannot answer because I don't remember how what I did to it. I must have probably taking it out of my salary each time that they took it out of my salary each time I worked at the Sands Hotel, or I had done more work and, and paid for that stock with that money, with those monies. The allegation has been made, Mr. Sinatra, and you possibly are aware of it undoubtedly, that your position in the Sands, that you were fronting points for no. perhaps a hidden interest. In no, that's not true. It's not true. To your best knowledge, while a licensee at the Sands, was money ever illegally diverted to anyone? Not that I know of, no. Were you as a owner and stockholder ever paid a dividend? I don't know. Do you know? Well, you recall, mean, Mr. Rudin, if there were any dividends paid by the Sands Hotel during the period of time? Not any dividends, but I think they redeemed their debentures. The initial investment was in the form of stock and the benches, interest was paid on the benches, the benches were redeemed. My recollection is because based on the fact that I knew there was a tax case, some litigation involving whether the benches were really in fact the benches or stock and whether the redemption of the benches was indeed a dividend, indeed not a dividend. Uh, but I did not handle the books at that time. I did not supervise the economic activity. No, that was the situation based on subsequent litigation. Um, uh, Mr. Sinatra and Mr. Rudin, whichever one of you would like to or have the knowledge on this, if the facts of the Cal Neva incident are, as, as you have indicated, that you were not there, and uh, as you've explained them to us, why did you then opt in uh, October of 1963, of 1963 to forward the letter to the Nevada Gaming Commission relinquishing all your licenses. I think that I probably convinced Mr. Sinatra that should, he should do it based on a personal conversation I had with Jack Warner. I don't want to take the time of the board to explain the complexities of the transaction about to be entered into between Warner Brothers and Frank Sinatra. Uh, we really completed that deal after six months of negotiations, and I have furnished the board with a copy of the original press release, and I uh, believe uh, in August or even before then, announcing the deal. Jack Warner called me to his office and said that, one, he felt that the publicity attendant to any hearing on whether Frank's license should be revoked 
was publicity that he did not want to see continue, particularly in, in view of the much closer relationship between Jack, his company, and Frank. And secondly, he felt that Frank should get out of Las Vegas, that it was not that meaningful economically, as meaningful as the deal we were making with Warner Brothers. And he, Jack Warner, would prefer that Frank not be involved in Nevada and uh, felt he was justified in making that request. In effect, he was saying to me, we're not going to go ahead unless you and Frank give me assurances that Frank's getting out of Nevada. I then discussed it with Mr. Sinatra. Uh, Your testimony then is then contrary to whatever uh, charges might have been levied by the control board. That was not the uh, motivating factor in asking and having you go, but it was your negotiations with, with Warner Brothers, which I presume is the basis of Judge Claiborne's affidavit. That's correct. I called Harry Claiborne up and said, Harry, it's a change of signals. PBS also had extensive recorded coverage of the Nevada Gaming Board hearing the following day. Good evening. On one level, what happened yesterday before the Nevada State Gaming Control Board clearly does not qualify as important. What does it really matter that Frank Sinatra denied he was a bad guy and as a result will likely be able to participate in the operation of a Las Vegas casino? But there's more to it than that. Sinatra, for one thing, the skinny, bow-tied crooner of the 40s turned movie actor, old blue eyes turned combative hater of the press, the cocky friend of presidents. He's an American celebrity about whom few are neutral, a man described in testimony yesterday by actor Gregory Peck as one of the finest, most trustworthy, truthful, reliable men he had ever known. By New York Times columnist William Sapphire last month as a friend of racketeers trying to buy respectability through friendship with President Reagan. It's his closeness to Mr. Reagan that makes it more than a routine showbiz or local Nevada story. Sinatra produced the inaugural gala here in Washington, January 19th. He attended the intimate White House birthday party for the president last week, and he put Ronald Reagan down as a character reference on his gaming license application. But it was not his association with Mr. Reagan that Frank Sinatra was asked about yesterday. The questions had to do with organized crime figures Lucky Luciano, Carlo Gambino, and Sam Giancana confessed mob hitman Jimmy Fratiano and the mob's alleged looting of Terrytown, New York's Westchester Premier Theater, among other things. Sinatra in action as a singer is a familiar sight. Sinatra as a talker, a witness, is a rarity. So tonight, thanks to public station KLVX Las Vegas, we're going to show extended excerpts from yesterday's hearing. The allegation has been made, and I'm sure you're not unfamiliar with it, that early in your career, that one of the reasons you progressed was due to the efforts of some members of organized crime. How would you respond to that allegation? Simply, it's ridiculous. Did you at any time in those uh, early years play nightclubs that, to your knowledge, were either owned or controlled by members or associates of what's called organized crime? I could never prove that to you, ever. So of your own knowledge. Possible. Of your own knowledge, you didn't know that. Right, correct. But what I'm trying to say, sir, is that there was always gossip as to who owned it or who ran it. But uh, uh, one would perjure oneself by saying, well, I'm sure that so-and-so owned the club. But there were sometimes reason to suspect that that might have been the case. And maybe so. And they, and they were, uh, many of them were these so-called nefarious people were very, very good customers. They came to those places, mm -hmm. which is very knowledgeable to most entertainers. That's where we go back to the picture-taking again, if I may repeat that for a moment. It was common knowledge. It is in Caesar's Palace right now, where one of the members of the, of the, of the casino will come in and say, would you take a photograph with uh, three Chinamen from Hong Kong? And I say, fine. So you take a picture. Now, I wouldn't know their reputation. I'm not about to ask for a sputum test mm -hmm. because it would embarrass everybody. Mm, I can understand that. At that particular time uh, in your life, did you, did you knowingly, and I, in other words, know for a certainty that some of the people you might be associating with or might be brought back to meet you or that you might see in the, uh, in the cafes or where you were working uh, were members uh, 
or associate associates of those people well, in organized again, crime? Uh, again, it was a matter of uh, uh, conjecture on somebody's part, what I read in newspapers and then saw faces and then began to meet these people. But I never had anything to do with them business-wise, mm -hmm. uh, rarely, rarely socially. Uh, no, no connection really whatsoever. From what you've said to us, I would conclude that it would be your testimony that you received then no illegal money from any means. I have in never Europe. in my life, sir, received any illegal monies. Okay. And you I've did had to not work very hard for my money. Thank you. Sinatra acknowledged acquaintances with a number of prominent mafia leaders, such as the late Sam Giancana, but asserted that he had no business dealings with them. A Washington Post reporter said Sinatra was totally in control of his corporation, which, judging from his demeanor, seemed to be the state of Nevada. In 1976, Sinatra had his picture taken backstage at the mob-controlled Westchester Theater in New York, and the photo included many known mobsters, including New York mob boss Carlo Gambino, who at the time of the photo had been the chairman of the National Crime Syndicate for the past 13 years. We've heard a great deal about photographs today, and we would like to give you, Mr. Sinatra, an opportunity to respond to a photograph that has received a great deal of notoriety, one in which uh, you appear with Mr. Carlo Gambino and several of his associates, some of which were also uh, principals in the Westchester Theater. I wonder if you could explain to us, uh, again for the record, just general terms, uh, as you recall the incident, uh, why it happened and uh, how it possibly can happen. I'd be happy to. I was uh, asked by one of the, m one of the members of the theater who, who he was as doesn't come to me, does I don't think it's that important. He told me that Mr. Gambina had arrived with his granddaughter, whose name, perchance, happened to be Sinatra. Her daddy is a doctor in New York, and we're not related at all. And he said they would like to take a picture, and I said, fine. They came in, and I took a picture of the little girl. And before I realized what happened, there were approximately eight or nine men standing around me. And, and, and several other snapshots were made. That is the whole incident that took place. The Nevada Gaming Board, which is the investigative body, voted three to zero in favor of Sinatra, but the Nevada Gaming Commission still needed to give final approval for the gaming license. Commission Chairman Harry Reid warned the public that the five-member gaming commission still had a hearing coming up in about a week. Frank Sinatra does not have a license in the state of Nevada yet, and I don't think he can count on the fact that he has one until we meet uh, a number of days from now. Not a certainty. That's for damn sure. I think that we're going to have to have a little more definite uh, question and answers reg regarding the Giancana episode. Good evening. For the second time in about a week, state gamers are taking up the question of a gaming license for Frank Sinatra. Last week, the control board gave unanimous approval to Sinatra, and that recommendation now comes to the Gaming Commission meeting here today at City Hall. I see that Mr. Sinatra is just now entering the room. He has his attorneys with him. The room is not, a, not quite as crowded as it was last week, still not a, a full house as uh, was anticipated. This uh, meeting this morning is estimated to go, well, maybe an hour and a half. Some think certainly not more than three hours. There will be some differences between this meeting and the one we saw last week. Uh, first of all, of course, the five-member commission will be hearing uh, the material and the testimony this morning. Last week, Sinatra had eight witnesses appearing on his behalf. We have heard of just one this morning, Jilly Rizzo, who will be appearing. After the two-hour hearing on February 19th, with Sinatra testifying for 15 minutes, the Nevada Gaming Commission voted 4-1 to one in favor of Sinatra, with Carl Dodge the lone dissenting vote. Dodge felt that the mob ties were without merit, saying, 
The record indicates quite conclusively that the case against Mr. Sinatra has been manufactured out of printer's ink, but Carl Dodge wanted a six-month license approved instead of a license with no time restriction because there was an active court case back east that might connect Sinatra to the mob. Commission Chairman Harry Reid initially thought that Sinatra should not get a license, but after studying the results of the 13th month investigation, the gaming board hearing, and the gaming commission hearing, he changed his mind saying, I have to be very candid and honest in saying that I was totally wrong. I think it's fair to say we were out to get him. He's a big shot. We're the gaming commission. Yeah. So we did, at the time, the most expensive background check on anyone. And we got the reports back. Frank Sinatra wasn't a bad guy. He did so many nice things for people. I mean, uh, I mean, it took a long time to read that report, but I and the other members of the Gaming Commission said, you know, we've been headed off in the wrong direction, this guy. Harry Reid did have one regret during his career on the Gaming Commission, and that was reading a poem just before the vote to approve Sinatra's gaming license. And so we, we were, the commission meeting is called, and I'm the chairman, and I read some stupid poem. Uh, I don't know where I got it, but that's something I wish I hadn't done. It, it, it was below the dignity of that historic meeting. So yeah, I wish I hadn't read that stupid poem. But by vote time, Reed had changed his tune, quoting a poem he had received. He's been brought to his knees, he's given a clean fight. To err is human, but Frank proved he's right. The 1981 hearing was held during an economically difficult time for Las Vegas. Potential tourists were frightened by two recent hotel fires. Three months earlier, the MGM Grand Fire killed 87 people and injured 627. It is the deadliest disaster in Nevada's history and the third deadliest hotel fire in the United States. Good evening. At least 75 people have died today in a fire in the biggest hotel in Las Vegas. Another 300 were injured. The fire was in the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino, which was built in 1973. About a thousand people escaped by fleeing to the hotel roof where they were lifted off by helicopters. The fire began shortly after 7 in the morning and spread throughout the ground floor casino and the famous showroom in a matter of minutes sending thick black smoke up through the entire 26-story structure. The Grant has more than 2,000 rooms. There were believed to be some 4,500 guests in the hotel. Many of them tried to get fresh air by breaking windows. The day before the gaming board hearing on February 10, 1981, the Las Vegas Hilton was set on fire intentionally by a busboy with a criminal past. Eight people were killed, about 350 people injured, and the busboy got life in prison without parole. Potential tourists were concerned about the lack of fire regulations, and because of these two fires, significant regulations were established, including requiring fire sprinklers at all hotels. Inflation was a serious problem, and by the summer of 1981, the economy was in recession. Gas prices were limiting how many people from Southern California were driving to Vegas. And five years earlier, Atlantic City, New Jersey legalized gambling and was seen by some as a major threat to Las Vegas. Most public officials here, as well as casino owners and the state's major newspapers, endorsed Sinatra's proposed re-entry into Nevada gambling as a shot in the arm for the state's economy. It was clear, although unstated, that the economic situation here was paramount in the hearing. It was equally clear that the result of the hearing was a foregone conclusion. Local casino owner Claudine Williams, who didn't personally know Sinatra, testified on his behalf saying she wanted him to get a gaming license for selfish reasons, because when Mr. Sinatra plays on the strip, my cash boxes are full. Gaming Control Board Chairman Richard Bunker said, I get sick and tired of hearing that everything that happens in this state happens because it's wired beforehand. I have come to the point where I really don't care what people outside of Nevada think of us, whether it's the national media or the public.
Bunker went on to say, I'm not suggesting he's a saint by any means, but in the areas we investigated, we have not found any substantive reason why he shouldn't have a gaming license. They slobbered all over him when he came in. Let me begin by saying that I never invited Mr. Giancana to Cal Neva. I never hosted for him, and I never saw him at Cal Neva. Well, it's a lie. We knew that was a lie. Of course he hosted Giancana. We had him dead to rights on that. Aye. Aye. <laughs> the board approved his license. I felt they caved in. It was a betrayal. It was a betrayal of the people of the state of Nevada. Ronald Reagan, it emerged, had said he was an honorable person, completely honest. Told me that political power, if you have enough political power or, or dough, you can get it done. I don't allege any payoffs there. I think you're talking about pure political power reaching right to the White House. By today's standards, Frank Sinatra would not have been given a gaming license based on what was known by Nevada gaming officials in 1981.